I'm going to take about 10 minutes to just get some information about your early years and influences. You can just do it any way you want to do All it. Alrighty. <laughs> just like you plan. Okay. All right. So Let's what, have it. So what was your name at birth, please? Delores Patricia Early was my name at birth. Okay. And uh, when were you born? 1931, July the 6th. Can you imagine life back in the 1930s for black people? And where were you Detroit, born? Michigan. And where did you grow up? Detroit, Michigan. Okay. And what was your father's name? Richard Thad Early. And what did he do for a living? He poured steel, literally poured steel. Okay. And how about your mother's name? Nellie Early. Okay. And what did she do? She was a cook. She was a house cleaner. She was a floor scrubber. She was my father's help meet. Okay. And what traits do you think that you've inherited from your parents? Oh my goodness. Uh, my father gave me a work ethic. I saw him go to work every day in the snow with a cold, with a backache, with a stomach ache. He went to work anyway. So he gave me an understanding about uh, keeping my work appointments. Uh, my mother was very spiritual. She was a personal friend of God. And so uh, we had uh, an understanding that uh, he was the head of the house and I still feel that he's the head of the house and I still feel that the things that I saw her do and the way that I saw her live was very important and it is a part of my life. I may not be able to describe it for you but I know it's in there. And um, if we could just go back for a second, um, the origin of your name, where, where did, you, where did that, that come from? My mother. Where'd your name come from? <laughs> Did, was there a particular reason that she named you what she named you? Did she have I think it's because she it? liked it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, did you have any siblings? I had five sisters and a brother, but they were all grown except for my brother and adults when I was born. My oldest sister was 20 when I was born and count down two years at a time uh, down to my brother and I, we were uh, three years apart. Okay, and uh, what were some of your hobbies growing up? Oh, I, I don't know hobbies. Uh, I had to work, we, my mother had things to do and I had to do that. I, my mother wanted me to finish school because none of her children had ever finished school. So my main thrust was to finish school. But I had duties when I came home. Um, the bathroom was mine to clean. The dinner dishes were mine to take care of. Uh, if she had other work, if she was ironing, uh, she took in iron washing and ironing. If she was ironing, I, my evening might be spent folding the clothes. Or, or ironing something or sprinkling them and rolling them so that she, they would be ready for her to iron when she was ready. Okay. So I didn't have hobbies. They were not my hobbies, but I had full days. I had things to do, constructive things to do. Did you have a sense of what you wanted to be when you grew up? I always was what I wanted to be. And my mother says that when I was born and they slapped me, I didn't cough or she said I began to sing and I never stopped, so. Um, and so it, as you just mentioned, you started singing at a very early age. Uh, you ended up going on tour with gospel singer uh, Mahalia Jackson. But I had a whole career before Mahalia Jackson. When I was six years old, uh, my, I, <laughs> I sang until people were nervous. I sang continuously and uh, not knowing songs Per se, I sang whatever came in my mind, I sang that. And I might sing that for 20 minutes and set people to go crazy. And so one day she swooped me up, my mother, and took me to the church. And there were two magnificent men there pastoring the church. And they knew that children didn't know what you were talking about in the 11 o'clock service. He knew that the, the rituals didn't mean anything to the children. That's why we were so nervous in the seats and, and eat or else sleep. And so he decided that he would have a young people's church. 
and the men who were there who were studying to be ministers became our ministers. And we had a regular Sunday service, but on our level. Um, uh, how can I say that to you? Um, instead of it being um, so psychological, it was fairy ish That's what I'm trying to say. It was put down so that we could understand it. And the young men who were studying to be ministers, it gave them several approaches to their studies because they had to break it down so that we could understand it. So that helped them out too. And I was able to uh, remember the lyric and uh, stay on pitch. And so I became the directress of the Young People's Choir. And every fifth Sunday, we could sing in the big church. And I made sure that every fifth Sunday, what we sang was something I had a solo in. And so I created between seven and 13, which is when Mahalia came into my life. I created an audience and I was a star at my church. Okay, and so how did um, the meeting with her come about? A lady came who was pregnant, and she was a very healthy lady, and she nobody knew she was pregnant, and we didn't have air conditioning at that time. We had the funeral homes gave the churches fans, and this was a very hot day in July, and uh, there was no breeze blowing or anything, and the lady fainted, and. Uh, they took her to the pastor's study, and there was happened to be a doctor there in the audience, and he was a member of the church, and he came forward and discovered that the lady was pregnant. And uh, her husband told Mahalia, who had, I think, three engagements in the South, that he would not allow his wife pregnant to go into the South because at that time, uh, black people were not welcome into hospitals, and many people had died because there was no space for them. There was nobody to take care of them. And he said he wanted his child to live and his wife too, and so she could not go. And so the ministers asked my mother if I could go. At that time, I was a lyric soprano, and so was this lady. And they asked Ask my mother if I could go and do those three jobs with Mahalia, and my mother allowed me to go. Mm -hmm. um, so talk about the experience of being on tour with her at such a young age. Uh, Mahalia was magnificent. Um, I didn't particularly uh, like her because she didn't let me do what I wanted to. I thought when I got away from my mother, on the road, I'd be able to, you know, get down and break it loose and do all the stuff that she wouldn't let me do. And Mahalia was stricter than my mother was. But um, um, see, some things are just difficult to put into simple sentences. Um, it was a different experience because I know was with different people. I was doing different things, but it was not. Uh, an astounding, marvelous, what I've been dreaming of situation. It gave me a chance to, to learn the art of communication. That's the best I got out of it because Mahalia Jackson was a communicator beyond any description. And I learned from her. And so in that respect, it was a wonderful experience. And how old were you at that time? 13. Okay. And um, where did you go to high school? Can you imagine being on the road alone at, at, at the age of 13? In Detroit. Okay. And um, what did you do after you graduated from high school? I did two years. I did two years. Sounds like a jail. I don't mean it like that. I went two <laughs> years to Wayne University. And my mother died. And my father could not afford to um, keep me in college. And because my mother, as I said to you earlier, was his help meet. And that meant that half of what we had was gone. And so there was no money for me to finish college. What were you studying? When you were I wanted school? to be a psychiatrist, but I had to go through medicine first. And it meant what I wanted was going to take me 12 years, and there was not 12 years of money to do that. Can you imagine what we would have missed out on if she got to finish 
college and be a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. um, so then how did you end up pursuing, deciding to pursue a professional music career? Hunger. And can you tell me a little bit about that hunger? Decision. You don't know anything about <laughs> hunger? That's when you haven't had anything to eat and you don't have any money and, and you don't have any place to stay. And that, you know, it's not like three meals a day. It's, it's a kind of very depressing period. And uh, the only thing I knew how to do, uh, really knew how to do, was to sing. I had no credentials, uh, so uh, I drove a taxi for a while. I drove a vegetable truck for a while. I was a dental assistant, uh, secretary type, no, none of the medical work, but answer the phones and type the letters and send out the bills and things. And that kept me going and I would sing at night. And then when did you decide to make the move to New York to pursue music further? Um, they said if you could make it in New York, you could make it anywhere. And I said, well, let me go and see if I can make it in New York. Really is how. Uh, I got there by, I started in what I called a scootmobile. It wasn't really an automobile, but it would get me from place to place. I could go so far. I could go from Detroit to Cleveland. And then I'd be in Cleveland for maybe two weeks, three weeks. And then I could go from Cleveland to Pittsburgh. And I could be there two, three weeks. And then I could go from Pittsburgh to Harrisburg. And that, that's the way I got to New York. I worked my way mm -hmm. in my little scootmobile. So who were some of the singers and musicians you worked with in New York? Well, I worked with some singers that were really more important to my life before I got to New York. I had the opportunity to work with Ella and Sarah and Dinah and Billy Eckstein and, and oh, uh, Miles Davis and Erskine Hawkins and his band and Duke Ellington. And, so I, and I did that by working in a place called the Flame Show Bar, which was in my hometown. And I was the opening act, and so I got to be on stage with all of these people. Can you talk about um, getting to work with Nat King Cole? I loved, I was in love with Nat King Cole. And I didn't care who knew it, his wife, his mama. I didn't care, I was just in love with him. And uh, I, uh, my first tour, uh, big tour was with uh, Nat Cole because Erskine Hawkins Orchestra played for him and I was the vocalist with Erskine Hawkins Orchestra and I was so smitten with him that I would stand I, I opened the show and I would rush upstairs and change my clothes and come back and hide in the curtains so that I could watch him and I studied him and one of the biggest thrills of my life was that the band started teasing me about him and, and how I felt about him. And oh, they razzed me really good. And one night when the show was over, he closed the show and the show curtains closed. He made an announcement to the band that they should have more respect for me because I was learning I was putting my act together, and he was going to do everything he could to help me, and he didn't want to hear anybody laughing at me anymore. Well, goodness gracious, all up in heaven, all up. I just floated around for about a month. I just <laughs> never put my feet on the ground, because he had defended me, and he had recognized, I didn't even know, he I knew I was standing in the curtains, you know. He had recognized me, it was wonderful. Um. So, in the early part of your career, can you talk a little bit about any experience you had with racism in the industry? I was born black. What do you mean? <laughs> I'm not going to let you do me like this. My experience was I was born an Afro-American. My mother was Cherokee. My father was uh, 
an Afro-American gentleman. And so I was born into the circumstances of being black in 1931. And all the conditions available were different from the way they are since you've been born. And so I went through all of the things that one had to go through at that time to simply survive. Okay. Um, when did you land your first recording contract? I don't remember the year, but I was working at this place I was telling you about, the Flame Show Bar. And uh, the manager of the Flame Show Bar really liked what I was doing. And so he had a friend in New York. His name was Lee Maggot. And he kept saying to Lee Maggot that he ought to come to Detroit and see me. And eventually Lee Maggot came to see me. And he said to me, he watched two nights shows. We did three shows a night. He watched for two nights. And at the end of the second night, he said, if you ever happen to be in New York, call me. And so I went home that night and packed my bag and went to New York and called him. And what was it like to have your first hit within the still of the night? Well, it was a lot of things before the hit, you see. He was young, Lee Maggot. He was young and he was trying to make it. And I was young and I was trying to make it. And we were in no, in New York with no money whatsoever. He had, uh, he did have a marvelous singer who used to sing with Duke Ellington named Al Hibbler. And Al was working more than I, any of us, he or I. And so his commission from Al Hibbler, he would share with me so that I could have a, a bed to sleep in and some food to eat. And for a couple of years, uh, I would work Long Island one-nighters or weekends or, or something like that to survive. Survival was what it was about. And then he got, Lee Maggot, got a man named Jerry Blaine to come and hear me. And Jerry Blaine came to hear me, and he owned a, a recording company, Jubilee Recording Company. And he wanted to record me, and he did record me. And uh, in the still of the night, as you said, was my first recording. And it frightened me. I went home, I recorded, and I went back to Detroit. And it frightened me because one day I was walking down the street, and I heard my voice coming out of these doorways, and I had never heard that before. And I remember it, I stood by, once I got over being startled, it didn't frighten me, it startled me, I didn't expect to hear it. I stood by the door and laid my, wind, my face on the glass so I could hear it, and then I waited to hear what the people said about it, and they had said they liked it. And uh, it was, it was, mm, I don't have a word for it, but it was really good. Yeah. Um, do you remember the first time that you saw television? First time I saw television? Um, yes, uh, Erskine Hawkins was staying at uh, the Teresa Hotel in Harlem, and uh, in his room there was a television. And uh, I saw it there. I was f fascinated by it. But uh, I, didn't have, I didn't have one. There was not one in the room I was staying in. He was the star, and he had the star's room. And so he had the television. So every chance I got, I would go up and, and watch. Do you remember any of the shows that you would watch at that time? Uh, Jackie Gleason was a favorite of mine. And Sid Caesar was a favorite of mine. Uh, those are the only two I can remember that really were, you know, you rushed to. Ed Sullivan was a favorite of mine, but that, that was farther up in my career. But um, Jackie Gleason and Sid Caesar were, and Ed Sullivan were shows that you went home to see. Everybody gathered. Uh, I, if I had a television in my house, uh, three or four families used my television for those Sunday evening uh, shows, uh, Saturday night shows. Um, what was your first appearance on television? Ooh, Soupy Sales. 
uh, gave me a shot on television while I was working at the Flame Show Bar. He had a, a midnight show, sort of a uh, forerunner to uh, The Tonight Show. The format was that. And he was one of the first people who had that format. And so I would uh, do my set at The Flame, and then I'd go over and do something on his show. And uh, he had me all over like two, three times a week. You were talking about Ed Sullivan. You actually ended up appearing on Ed Sullivan. Yes, I was 18 times in one year. Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, do you remember your first meeting with Ed Sullivan? Well, you didn't meet with Mr. Sullivan. You did his show. We didn't all become personal <laughs> friends um, because I was doing his show. I, I, I was there. There was somebody to take care of me. There was a band rehearsal, and he would come out and say hello to everybody and and the likes of that you know he was very courteous but it wasn't like we were running buddies or anything like that my break with mr sullivan was that he his wife and he had a love song and it was the autumn concerto and i had just recorded a song that was an adaptation of the autumn concerto and it was called and that reminds me and so every time he felt like he wanted to make love, I guess, to his wife, he'd have me on the show and I'd sing, and that reminds me. And so he, that particular year, he wanted 18 times, and so I was on 18. <laughs> I guess, that's, well, that's what happened. However you take it, that's the way it went down. Um, do you remember who were some of the other acts that appear on the show? Oh, everybody was on Ed. It, you had to be on Ed Sullivan's show. That later uh, uh, dropped down to Johnny Carson's show. If you wanted to make it, you had to be on Ed Sullivan's show to get jobs across the world. You, on your resume, you would say I, she was on the Ed Sullivan show. And so the owner of the club would then feel that you would draw people because everybody watched the Ed Sullivan Sullivan show. So everybody was on. The Beatles was on. Elvis was on. He treated, he, he made Elvis not move and had him shoot him from the waist up because that was lewd what he was doing with his legs. I never understood why, but that was considered. But this was all before you were born, so <laughs> it, it wouldn't impress you now, but it was very important to us. Um, did you ever interact with Ed Sullivan on the show? No, you interact, no. Um, uh, he would say, hello, Della. Uh, he would say that was that's good. That was good, Della. I enjoyed that, Della. Uh, but he was not. He di didn't interact. He was not. He was the host of the show, and he uh, allowed everybody to do what they did. Um, do you remember your last appearance on the show? And did you know that it would be the last time that you'd be on his show? No. The 18th time? <laughs> no, uh, but that wasn't the last time. That was just 18 times in a year. I must have done his show for five or six years, but uh, not as frequently as that first year. Um, do, how so you were talking a little bit about you know you had to have Ed Sullivan, you know. Yes, you, your... uh, the young people you should have seen some of Johnny Carson. You had to be on Johnny Carson's show because then that would be on your resume and people then would accept you as being a recognized professional. Because it's not like Johnny Carson's show was the bridge between not making it and making it because you had done Johnny Carson's show. Mm -hmm. So how do you think the exposure of being on Ed Sullivan helped your career overall? Tremendously, tremendously. Okay. Um, so going into you know, the 1960s, um, you kind of made the rounds of the talk show, variety show, circuit. Um, what were some of your most memorable experiences on those shows? Well, there were a lot of shows in the 60s. Uh, Andy Williams had a show. Uh, Dino had a show. Um, oh, there were so many, I can't even call them back to mind. Uh, Steve Perry Allen. Como had a show. Steve Allen had a show. Um, and, and they were musical shows, musically based. They had comedy also, but they were musically based. So uh, I was on all of them on a regular basis. That became my second line of, line of work. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about how you met Merv Griffin? 
I went to do, uh, I was working in New York and Merv was doing a radio show. And uh, at that time, Basie, Count Basie, had written a song that had a really marvelous groove to it, just was wonderful. And everybody that announced something had this song in the background because it was an uplifting thing. Uh, commercials had it, uh, people who had radio shows had it, and so did Merv. And so Merv and I, Merv began to sing the weather report to, this, to the groove of this Basie number. And I began to sing the weather report also. And so we just really had a marvelous time. It was written on the cue cards, or the, you know, so that you could see it. So we just began to sing it. I don't know why we did that, but we did. We began to sing it, and and uh, after that, uh, uh, we did. Uh, he had some kind of a, an affair that he was raising money for, and and after the radio show, I went with him to that affair where I met his wife to be. And um, then he got this television show. And at that time, if you had a hit record, you could sing if you were black. You could sing on the show. But nobody ever invited you over to sit down and talk. You just, they would open the curtains. You would sing. They would close the curtains. And the uh, master of ceremonies would start some other conversation and move on to the next thing. Well, having done this song of the weather report with Merv and having spent that day with him, he knew that I could carry on a conversation. And so he broke the barrier and he invited me to come over and sit down on the couch. And can you imagine being the person to open doors for other people? It was, he said, one of his best shows because we clowned, we sang, we laughed, and that made it possible for the other people to say, come on over and sit down because they found out I had some comedic talent and, and that I could hold my place with whoever was there. So Merv made a big, important stance in my life. How frequently did you do his show? Do you remember? Oh, any time he called me. Yeah. I didn't keep a list, but any, uh, it was good. I was here. I was available. So if somebody didn't make it, I've, I've had this wonderfulness. I have it now with Larry King. If somebody doesn't make it and they need somebody in a hurry, they'll call me. Merv was that way. Johnny Carson was that way. If they needed somebody to fill the spot, they would call me and I would go. Um, so, talking about uh, some of these shows in the 60s, you also did uh, a game show, uh, Hollywood Squares. Yes. And yes, I did. <laughs> I did do that. Can you talk about being on that show? That was a good show. Uh, it was the first time that I had been on a show like that. It started with Hedda Hopper, the first one I did, and I, oh, I want to call this man's name. Uh, he wrote a song, he took a classic and, and wrote a camp theme on it. Uh, Hello Mama, Hello. Alan Sherman. Alan Sherman was on the show. And uh, Alan Sherman took uh, a masculine approach as to women staying in their places, being barefoot and in the kitchen. And, and I see, he said, um, he said something to the effect that uh, women aren't needed and I said to him well one woman wasn't needed because she gave birth to you and we really didn't need that well Hedda Hopper started laughing and laughed so we had to take a break from the shooting and she wrote it up in her column and uh, it just got such press that they kept uh, Marshall was his name the host of Hollywood Squares when I was there. Uh, they kept calling me back on that same kind of a, a premise, and so I did that a lot. Um, how did you feel about doing a game show? I mean, I, to the other I shows. like a variety of things. I get bored very easily, and so the more things that are available for me to do, the better I like it. Wow. Um, in 1968, you got a role on the Mod Squad. Yes. And um, do you remember what the role was and how that all came about? Well, now, all, at that time, 
the premise, the general premise was that the star had a hangout place. And in this place was a lady that he trusted, he could get his messages from, uh, he would go there for a drink after work, that kind of a, a place. And uh, that was my first job with them. I owned this jazz room that they came into when they were off work. But I did several of those too. I did, I did it, um, the, they went into ice houses, that's what they were called. And uh, I played that lady several times. Um, was, th was that the point, do you think, where you started to make a transition from singing into acting? Or? Oh, I see what you're, I was sitting in a Howard Johnson in the winter time on a road, not even in town, on a road. And I turned on the television and this person who will be nameless was singing and it was like somebody was hitting me. I kept <laughs> uh, 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 that kind gave me that kind of a Thinking about it don't make me feel good right now, but gave me a really ugh feeling. And when she finished, they talked about what a marvelous actress she was and how they could hear her acting ability in the song and how she delivered the song. And I'm sitting there, I'm getting so mad, I don't know what to do. I don't know why she should even be in the business period. And I began to think about it, you know. Was, was, was that why she was there? Because she was an actress, because she surely wasn't a singer. And out there on the road, I thought about that. And then I, it, 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 just like this, it occurred to me that when I was singing, I was already acting. Because every time I sang the blues, I wasn't blue. But I had to act like I was blue so the audience would get that feeling. And when I sang how happy I was, I wasn't always that happy, but I had to act like that. And that was the door opener for me. I began to look for things to do that had drama in them, in my music and uh, in the acting field. We talked about Merv Griffin. Um, how about the Mike Douglas show? Mike was wonderful. Mike was another person who tore down the barriers. Mike would have a, a co-host or hostess every week. And uh, usually it was, you know, uh, the same thing. You could come on and sing, but you couldn't co-host. And so uh, he and I talked in the dressing room one day and we laughed and I told him a few jokes and we had a good time getting made up to do for me to sing on his show. And uh, he invited me back to be a co-hostess. And can you talk about um, the Della Reese show from, it was 1969 to 70. How did, how did the show come about your own the, show? <laughs> the man who was directing Mike Douglas's show left Mike Douglas's show. I don't know why. And I was working in Chicago on stage in a nightclub. And he came in, his name, uh, Woody Frazier is his name. He came in to see the show. And in my show, I talk some and I tell a few jokes and I sing some. And when, when it was over, he came backstage and he congratulated me. But he's a real play, a person who plays in kids. He's about seven years old. And so he said, how would you like to do a television show? I said, I'd love it. He said, good, we'll do one. I said, wonderful, call me when you're ready. That was the whole conversation. He went his way and I went my way. Three weeks later, he knocked on my door with a director, a set designer, and he said, are you ready to do the show? And I said, if you're ready, I'm ready. What markets was it shown in, do you remember? It was shown everywhere except Chicago. It was shown in New York, too. And uh, the eastern states, uh, Connecticut, and, 
But they were very surprised because they thought that it would not sell. I had a mixed orchestra. I had uh, Caucasians and Latin people in the orchestra, and I was an uh, Afro-American woman. And so they thought it would not sell in the South, but in Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia, we had our biggest audiences. Um, do you have any memorable guests, any favorites? Oh, yes. I have a wall full of them upstairs. Muhammad Ali, I just looked at him the other day when I came through the hall. He was there. Uh, um, Carmen was there. Sarah was there. Uh, um, Sammy Davis was there. Duke was there. Ethel Waters was there. Um, oh, um, so many people, because we did 292 shows. And we had two or three people on each one of the shows. Uh, the young singers who were coming up were on the show. Um, we had uh, Louis Prima was on the show. We had we had uh, animals. We had uh, uh, people with gadgets, and it was a very interesting format. Um, were there, was there anyone that you can remember that was up and coming, like you were saying, that um, did your show maybe first and then hit big? I don't know that I'm responsible for anybody's success, but the door was always open to people who had talent. My door is always open to people who have talent. Uh, was the civil rights movement reflected in the show in, in any way? Reflected in the show. Can you imagine how many people are known, I mean, well known, um, I don't think so because we, as I just said to you, we had mixed uh, people there. We had, it was not reflected in the people of the show, but it was still going on around us. We should get to this civil rights thing because you want to hear about this. Um, it was impossible to, to live a normal, correct life because there were so many people who had no respect for black people, who thought that we were a minor race, that we were stupid, we were uh, lazy, we were sloven, and they reacted to us in that way. It made no difference that these things were not true necessarily any more than in any other race, but that was the brand that we were carrying. And so we had to suffer the things that people did to us that were not things that people should do to you. I have not had uh, many trying experiences because nobody does that to me. I don't care what your ethnic background is or your opinion is. There's only so much that you can do to me. There's ever only been so much that you will do and then I have a need to react. Exactly. And do you remember how the show ended? Your show. One day he came and he said, the reason, I should give you the reason, Woody had signed on to spend X amount of dollars. I don't know what those dollars were. But we had an orchestra, full orchestra, 16 pieces. We had uh, guests that cost money. And the money that he had allotted was not enough. And so every show, we were ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 over, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 over every time we do a show uh, runs the budget up too high. And we were dealing with a tire manufacturer. And he knew that if you poured a certain amount of rubber, you would get X amount of tires and you could get X amount of dollars from that. He could not understand that this was not that kind of business, that this was, the, the budget was going to change depending who we had on the show. He could not deal with that. He just knew that he could put the money in rubber and he would make X amount of tires or whatever they make out of rubber and he would then uh, have a refund that he wanted. And so eventually our overruns got to be too much. And they wanted then to cut the show down. They wanted to take out the orchestra. They didn't want to have an audience. They, didn't, they just wanted to tear the show down. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. So if it's time for it to be over, let it be over. Um, in your book, you talk a little bit about the show not selling because you were a black woman. What was the climate like? For well, it was, it was like this. Uh, the man who was selling our show 
said he couldn't sh sell our show because my gums were black. Am I silent in here now? That was his rationale. He never tried to sell the show. He didn't want the show to go. And his reason for not being able to sell it was that my gums were not pink. He said they were black. They're blue, but he said they were black. And he couldn't, because of that, every time I smiled, I turned people off. Was, did you have a reaction to him? You, <laughs> you don't want to me to say that on your show. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you feel that doing that show helped pave the way for other women in television? I've been blessed that I have had the, I haven't had to make the money that the other people made, but I've been blessed that I opened the doors so people could get in. And I'm very thankful that uh, they got in and did so well. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, The Tonight Show and Johnny Carson before. Um, do you remember the first time that you appeared on The Tonight Show? Well, it was my first hit record. That's when I appeared. Yeah. That's how you got to Johnny Carson's show. Did you meet Johnny at that time? Yes, yeah. I met him. Uh, I met him, uh, I don't even remember what year that was, but whatever record was a hit at that time, I went on his show to do that record. And then um, you, he approached you about being a guest host on the show. Yes. And yeah. how did that I was doing Della, my show. Mm -hmm. And he, bless him, he loved his audience and he did not want to just stick somebody in there. He wanted somebody that he felt would entertain his audience as he had entertained them all those 30 years. And so he started um, interviewing or selecting people and uh, I was working in the same studio he was working in, in Burbank. They've been about to tear it down now, but I was working. My show was on this side and his was on that side. And one day, day in, the, in the, the hallway, we passed each other. And he said, how'd you like to, to try out hosting? And I said, I'd love it. And he invited me. I was the first woman of color to do that. I think I was the first woman to do that. But did you, how did you feel when he approached you about it? Were you nervous? Or I felt a, good. Yeah. You feel good when you succeed. You feel good. You know, when, when people ap appreciate you, you feel good. Uh, you, you feel it's worthwhile. You feel you're glad you're there getting that. Um, any nervousness about preparing to, to go and do this? I don't know when the last time I was nervous yeah. about my craft. I don't know that I was ever nervous. I, I'm concerned about the lyric. I'm concerned about the words. And I'm uh, on the way to it. I'm thinking about that. But once I step into that zone, I don't even think about that anymore. Um, also in the 70s, you started doing um, some work on shows like Police Woman, Medical Center. Mm -hmm. um, what types of roles were you being offered on those shows? Oh, I right. was a nurse on Medical Center. Uh, I was a police woman on, on you know. I, I came to the script, that's how I can say that. Whatever the script was, I came to the script. They decided that that part was a part that they thought I could play. And so I came to the script, which was coming to the lyric without the music for me. Um, in 1975, you played yourself on Sanford and Son in an episode of Sanford and Son. Um, how did that come about? Red was my friend for 40 years. I really, a good friend, not just somebody I knew. We, we were hungry together. Yeah, how did you and meet him originally? In a club in Chicago 84 years ago. You know, we were, we were all in there to see somebody I don't know who, and we enjoy, were enjoying it, and, and uh, just how you meet somebody in a club. That's so all. you had a personal relationship with him? He was my friend yeah. for 40 years. And then how, how was it to work with him on a show? He like was that? my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to play with you if you keep doing this. Um, so that was your first sitcom then, Sanford and Son? No. No. Okay. Were there others? What was it? Oh, those that you, uh, the police woman was a sitcom. 
police woman was actually a drama. But it the, the one the role that I played, I played this cop that was more home friendly, homely, home bodied than uh, the average staunch cop. I didn't have to. So you felt you were doing comedy already. It was my. Yeah. That's what that was my. That was the salt to the the thing. This little comedic moment so that it wouldn't be all dark and dire. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there were, there were, uh, well, those were musicals. Uh, doing, doing, like Dean's show, uh, you did comedy. It was a musical show, but you did comedy, and, and bits and pieces of comedy. Um, um, Carson's show was bits and pieces of comedy. I sang something, but then I came to the to the uh, couch and the, the comedy. It's an interwoven mm -hmm. uh, thing to keep it from being uh, so blah. You, you add a little salt to it. Mm -hmm. um, how about joining the cast of Chico and the Man? I loved it. Yeah, I loved. It. That was a wonderful cast. Um, he was so fresh and so energetic. And uh, Jack was, there's no words for Jack for an entertainer. Jack remembered the first joke he ever told. Um, he, he remembered the first situation comedy he was ever in. He, um, if we were lost for something to say, he knew the right words to say. He wasn't writing the show, he was the star of the show. But he had so much in here, he had been an entertainer so long that he had an answer for almost everything. He danced well. He, uh, he and, and Satchmo, uh, not Satchmo, uh, oh, marvelous comedian. Um, I'm going to tell you his name before it's over. Scatman? Scatman. He played uh, mandolin, and he and Jack would do an act with him playing the mandolin and them telling jokes and the comedy, that, not written, not written, you know. He would strum something, and Jack would say, that reminds me of when Sam and Joe did, and they, they're, now they're off. That just that much, and they'd be off, and they would entertain us on the rewrite days and the days when it took too long to get the script, and the, you know, so it was it was all fun and games. It was wonderful, and Freddie was magnificent. He was a natural comedian. Um, so you came into that show. It was already had already been on the air a few years. Yes. So the, can you describe the character that you played in, in this? I was. I had a roach coach. Uh, a meal on wheels, uh, you know, where you come and cook for the people who are working. And um, I owned the land that Jack's garage was standing on. And so that's how I was in contact with him, getting my rent, uh, telling him he couldn't park this here and he couldn't. Um. We were talking about um, Freddie Prince. Oh, I'm sorry, the character that you were playing. Uh, I was, I was, um, I had someone to drive the coach, so I was on the premise a lot. And Jack did things that were not in his lease. And that's how we had this back and forth going. You know, he, he put cans out where they shouldn't be. He knew they shouldn't be there, but he, his character was, whatever I'm not supposed to do, I'm gonna do that. And so we had this between us all the time. And then um, Freddie, somehow or another, not written, came like I was his mother. He began to, on the set, act like that, you know, like we, I was his guardian or his mother or something, and whoever was writing said, let's put that in. And so that became, that became my relationship with him. When Jack got on his nerves, he would come across the alley and uh, talk to me and, oh, we'd figure out something. So I became an intricate part of it. Do you have any favorite episodes that you can think of? Not really. It's been so long ago, and I've done so many things since then. I, I don't have any 
Real, not really, no. Um, how long did you have to learn the script for a show for Chico and Well, we started on Monday and we, we shot on Friday evening. And did you tape in front of a live audience? Yes, two. Um, in your book, you talk a little bit about Freddie being a prankster. He on was. The set. He was. Um, always? It always. Was, yeah. oh, every day he had a something. Do you have any stories? Or he had, well, he would hit the wall. And, and the wall would crumble because they, those, the walls in studios are not put up for a house to live in forever. So we would come in, there'd be a hole in the wall. And or he, took, he took martial arts. So we would come in and he would be jumping from table to table or whatever his lesson was in martial arts, he would be doing that. Or he would bring something that had no business there, a raccoon. And turn it loose, and and you know, just just <laughs> he was a little boy. He really was. He he. What happened was he was he had too much too soon. He was just reached in the barrio, picked him up, and put him in the president's Oval Office, and that it was there was no time to learn to expand. Did you ever feel any tension between him and the producers or the directors or something? No, everybody knew him to be what he was, a little boy. And so they really treated him that way, which I, I'm not sure was the right thing to do because it encouraged him to continue to do that. But um, um, you, you couldn't help but love him. He had such charisma. How did you learn that he had died? They called, no, I was in Cleveland. Yes, I was in Cleveland and my daughter's nanny called me and told me that what had happened, and I came home immediately so I could be here. Um, how did the rest of the cast and the crew take his death? It was overwhelming. It was something you never expected at all. You know, it, he had so much to live for, and it was a mistake. He didn't intend to do that. It was just another one of the things, clowning, that he did. Things He, he liked for you to go, <gasps> That this turned him on, if he could make you do that. And that was another time, only this time it was terrible. How did the show try to go on without him? How did they well, they got him? another little boy, and uh, uh, they brought him from, supposedly in the script, uh, his mother was couldn't get out of Mexico, but she had put him across the border or something. and. Uh, uh, Somebody had told Jack about him, and Jack had accepted him to take care of him till his mother could get across the border, or somebody from his family could get across the border. But the audience didn't, they wanted Freddie, they didn't want, there was something between Freddie and Jack. You know, something, uh, Jack could give vent to that old man rage that he did so well. And uh, uh, Freddie could react, had a great reactions for that. So did you feel that the, just being on the set was so much different without Freddie? It was different. The show was different. The scripts were different because now we're dealing with a young man, a young boy, uh, 9, 10, 11 years old, something like that. So the jokes had to be different. They couldn't be the jokes that could be for Freddie, who was uh, a man talking to a man. And so it was entirely different. And the uh, the public did not accept it that way. How did you uh, find out that they were going to cancel the show? Like you find out, they say, You're we're canceling the show. <laughs> were you surprised at that not point? Not really, because it wasn't the same. It wasn't the same. Um, how did the show end? I don't even remember. Okay. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about um, Welcome Back, Cotter which you did from 78 to 79. Well, Welcome Back, Cotter was produced by uh, Jimmy Comack, who also produced uh, Chico and the Man and several other shows. And so uh, we would, you need some but we're back to that. Uh, somebody didn't show, step in here, Dell, and do this. And we were all in the same building. So you stepped in for Gabe Kaplan. Several times. Not for Gabe, not necessarily. See, there are other characters, too. Uh, you have to have somebody. You have to have the lead. Then you have to have somebody that works with the lead regularly. Then you have to have other people for the lead to react to. And uh, Travolta was young. He was a part of the young group of people. There was school involved, so I was a teacher several times. 
I was a substitute teacher. Um, uh, I was the school nurse one time. You th parts that had to be played. And Jimmy would say, come over here and do this. I'd go do that and go back to my job. Um, do you have any uh, specific memories about that show and working with that cast? All good memories. Uh, it was a p very pleasant place to work. Uh, there was no hang-ups, no attitudes. Everybody wanted it to be wonderful, and we worked that way. Um, let's talk a little bit about this. Um, in October of 1980, you were taping a song for The Tonight Show, and you suffered a brain aneurysm. And can you talk a little bit about just that experience and how it affected everything? My brain exploded. Um, while I was doing the show, uh, my mother, the teachings of my mother, when it happened, I didn't know what was wrong with me. I wasn't sick, I didn't have a cold, I was fine. In fact, I was going on a vacation uh, with who, uh, my husband, who was my fiance at the time, and I was happy as I could be. And it, it, my, the aneurysm ruptured in my brain. And I said, into your hands I commit my spirit, and I was out. And they took me across the street to the hospital, and uh, they looked at me and looked at my size and decided that it must be something about the size I was that had made it happen. They didn't know what it was, but whatever had happened, they thought it had to do with my size. and so. They took my vital signs, and they were all good, and so they didn't know what was wrong with me. And so they sent me to another hospital, and they looked at me, and I was black and an entertainer, and they decided that it must be an overdose of drugs. And so they started looking for drug content in my system and there were no drugs and so I wasn't too fat and I wasn't a junkie so now nobody knew what was wrong with me. My son is a psychiatrist. He sent for my physician who came immediately and he said to them she's not, I see her three times a year, she's not on drugs and that's the size she is and there must be something else we should be looking for. And so that night, they discovered that the aneurysm had ruptured. And the next morning, they sent me to another hospital because this other hospital had the equipment necessary to deal with an aneurysm in my brain. And uh, they then uh, took x-rays and stuff and things. And after two weeks, they sent me to London, Ontario to Dr. Charles Drake. I had surgery, brain surgery, twice in 10 days. And 10 days after that, I was doing a commercial for Campbell's Soup. Wow, so a very, uh, so a quick recovery, it seems like. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> you Free for, for a brain aneurysm. <laughs> You're just wonderful, absolutely wonderful.